Hello, I'm Bob Trebshaw. I'd like to talk to you today about a 6th century Anglo-Saxon cemetery right on the border of Leicestershire and Nottinghamshire. And rather unusually, the five horses buried among the 120 or so humans. And does this suggest that there might have been some sort of horse cult in early Anglo-Saxon England? This cemetery straddles the Roman road known as the Foss Way. It's now the A46. Uh, this stretch of the Foss Way is between Leicester and Newark. The entire Roman road runs from Lincoln through Leicester and Cirencester towards the Dorset coast. Just to the south of the cemetery was the Roman small town of Vernometum. Little is known about this Roman settlement as it's never been investigated by archaeologists. The Anglo-Saxon cemetery is just inside the Nottinghamshire parish of Willoughby-on-the-Wolds. However, archaeologists refer to it by the name of the nearby farm, Broughton Lodge. Uh, but confusingly, Broughton Lodge Farm is no longer shown on maps because the farmhouse and buildings were demolished as part of the widening of the Foss Way. Uh, the former farmyard is now a karting raceway. The burials were excavated in haste between 1964 and 1968 in advance of this bridge over the Foss Way. And this is the comparable view in 1722. Uh, it's an engraving in William Stukeley's Itinerarium Curiosum, published in 1724. The area of the excavations is shown here overlaying a modern road map. This aerial photograph shows the western part of the bridge during construction. The cemetery is within this quadrant of the road junction. These previously unpublished photographs of the dig were taken by Rex Satterthwaite. The photograph shows several of the excavation team at work. One of the women is presumably Miss Hazel Wheeler, who was then director of excavations for the Trent Valley Archaeological Research Committee. In the background is Broughton Lodge Farmhouse and Petrol Station just prior to demolition. And these photographs show a few of the human skeletons prior to being lifted. The cobbled surfaces are almost certainly parts of the Roman Foss Way, even though some of the burials are lying on top of the cobbles. Because the 1960s were long before the start of developer-funded archaeological digs, they only started in the 1990s, these excavations were done voluntarily, well, apart from the last season in 1968 when funding was made available. The excavation director was Malcolm Dean, who was a mathematics teacher at Rushcliffe Boys' School in West Bridgeford. Malcolm mostly worked on site during the evenings and weekends, as well as school holidays, Considering how complex the cemetery was and how little time he had, then the excavations were done to a competent standard, at least by the standards of the 1960s. Here's a couple of Malcolm's plans of skeletons before they were lifted. However, the surviving excavation records can best be described as patchy. In 1970, before Malcolm Dean had finished writing up the excavation report, he was killed through no fault of his own, in a road traffic accident a little further north along the Foss Way. The excavation report was eventually completed by a team from Trenton Peak Archaeology, headed up by Gavin Kinsley, and published in 1993. The original course of the Roman road runs through the site, and the cobble surface survived in various places. When the road began to be used again in the late Anglo-Saxon period, it diverted in a shallow S-shape to the east, in part because the road now had Anglo-Saxon burials over it, and presumably to use to lie as an easy place to cross the Willoughby Brook. This shallow S-shape is still the course of the modern road. I make it one of the very few Anglo-Saxon bypasses to have existed, uh, let alone survived. The excavations were instigated prior to the building of Miss Overbridge when the A46 was widened in the 1960s. The graves of at least 121 people were discovered in just the area now covered by the Western Approach Road and its associated earthworks. The archaeological excavation seemingly established the boundaries of the cemetery except to the west where further unexcavated burials are probable. As I mentioned, the Roman small town of Vernometum was to the immediate south. Plenty of Roman potsherds were excavated by Malcolm Dean as they were in the backfill of the graves. 
but quite clearly the Anglo-Saxon cemetery was just outside whatever remained of the town in the 6th century. The location of the cemetery on the south side of a hill ridge, close to what was later the county boundary between Leicestershire and Nottinghamshire, is almost certainly not a coincidence. Anglo-Saxon cemeteries tended to be in somewhat liminal zones between settlement areas. All the burials at Broughton Lodge were inhumations. At the time, some Anglo-Saxons were cremated before burial. So, some Anglo-Saxon cemeteries, like Broughton Lodge, are all inhumations. Some other cemeteries are all cremations, um, as with Thermiston, nearer to Leicester. And yeah, some Anglo-Saxon cemeteries have a mix of inhumations and cremations. What's interesting about Broughton Lodge is that in addition to the 121 or more human burials, the remains of at least five horses were discovered, of which two were whole horse skeletons, both apparently young and healthy at the time of their death. There was also a complete sheep in a grave with both a human and a horse. But all the other animal remains suggest only bones from butchered portions. Animal burials were part of Anglo-Saxon funeral customs between about AD 450 to 650. Sheep or goats, it's impossible to tell the difference back then, were most common, followed by hogs, dog, pig, and, well, a wide range of other animals appearing occasionally. Most of the animal remains associated with human burials suggest cuts of meat, except for horses and dogs, which were presumably companion animals. Currently, a total of only 32 Anglo-Saxon horse burials are known, mostly in East Anglia and the Midlands. The horses buried were bigger than average, healthy, and usually about six to eight years old, and that fits the evidence from Broughton Lodge. Human burials with horse harness fittings among the grave goods, but no horse bones, are about as common as horse inhumations. The harness fittings are usually part of a set of grave goods with weapons, so indicating elite males. Now, while horse inhumations are found only in about 1% of human graves, in cremation cemeteries, the cremation of a horse as well as a human is much more common, being found with between 2 and 11% of the human remains. The inference is that in cremation cemeteries, horse burial is, well, less elite. Horse cremations have mostly been discovered around the Humber Estuary, the Wash, and in North Norfolk. Typically, there's a pair of pottery urns, one for the cremated human remains and one for the cremated horse remains. In the Spong Hill Cemetery in Norfolk, over 227 horse cremations are associated with just over 2,000 human cremations. Now, horse inhumation or cremation is one of a number of cultural traits which seem to have been introduced into England direct from Scandinavia, confirming what was already known about migration in the late 5th and early 6th centuries. Broughton Lodge Cemetery was in use from about 100 years from AD 500, so right in the middle of the period when horses were being buried with humans. This grave has two humans and one horse. Interestingly, the female has some very high-status grave goods, including this splendid brooch, whereas the male had no grave goods, so just might be a slave. A different grave has just one human and a horse. There's a weapon, so the person was almost certainly an elite male. Interestingly, the remains of a head bridle was discovered between the horse's legs. Um, From the grave goods, this person lived roughly 50 years after the elite female and her male companion. A third grave seemingly only has the foreleg of a horse, but this grave had been heavily disturbed. Archaeologists think that both the human and equine bodies were complete at the time of burial. Curiously, a fourth horse was not clearly associated with a human grave. Less than ten miles south along the Fossway, at one lip, a horse burial associated with Anglo-Saxon weapons was discovered in the 1950s. This suggests that an inhumation cemetery once existed, although the soil is not generally suited to the preservation of bone. To the south of Leicester, in Wigston, an antiquarian report of 1795 describes the discovery of horse bones, a snaffle bit and two shields. This suggests that a horse was buried close to two human graves. 
In 2017, Michelle Sanders, who's the daughter of Malcolm Dean, enrolled in the Institute of Continuing Education in Cambridge, and she used her father's work at Broughton Lodge as the basis for several case studies. In publicity for a talk given in 2019, she wrote, The existence of an Anglo-Saxon horse cult must remain speculation on the basis of current knowledge, but is nevertheless interesting to consider. So far as I'm aware, Michelle has not published her research. So, well, allow me to independently speculate about a horse cult in England. According to later medieval historians, one of the myths of the Anglo-Saxon settlers in eastern England was that they descended from two pioneering settlers named Hengist and Horsa, whose names mean stallion and horse. Uh, Later medieval kings and such like claimed extended genealogies were reliable for several generations, but then going back further in time, uh, shall we say becoming rather misty, with descent claimed from increasingly mythic characters. Well into the Christian era, many of the English kings had genealogies which started with the pagan deity Woden. For early Anglo-Saxon leaders to have genealogies going back to mythic horse deities, or anthropomorphised versions of such deities, is not simply plausible but entirely consistent with later evidence. It's not as if the Anglo-Saxons were the first to worship horses. In the Iron Age, beautifully crafted horse imagery on high-status metalwork is common in more high-status graves. The Uffington White Horse has been dated to the Iron Age, and the design is reminiscent of stylized horses on Iron Age coins. During the Roman era, the people of Northern Europe, the Gauls, had a deity called Epona, Her name means horse in Celtic languages, although surviving statues of Epona depict her in human form. Epona seemingly has a counterpart in the medieval Welsh collection of stories known as the Baminogion, and these describe a regal figure of Rhiannon riding a white horse, whose slow, effortless gait supernaturally outpaces all pursuit. Uh, In medieval Irish lore, another society with little or no contact with the Anglo-Saxons, the inauguration of new kings famously required the king to mate with a mare who embodied sovereignty of the land. Now, white horses exist only in literature and, well, as short-cut hill figures. In reality, so-called white horses are grey horses. They were born with usual brown and black colouring, but with a gene that causes premature loss of colour at the age of about six. The same genetic condition is present in some humans, too. A South Wales folk ritual called Marich Lued, or Grey Mare, is still undertaken in December, which some folklorists have held up as an apparent survival of the veneration of Rihanna or Epona. Um, but there's no firm evidence to support the age, the origins or purpose of the practice, and the same reservations also apply to the Maytime hobby horse rites at Padstow and Minehead. One tradition which still persists and strongly indicates that horses were once cult animals is the English taboo on eating horse meat. This dietary preference is not shared with France or Germany. Indeed, I've several times eaten fallen flesh in the works canteen of a Swiss company I worked for in the 1990s. In case you're wondering, it has a slightly coarser texture than beef and less flavour, but works very well with a tasty gravy or sauce. Almost certainly a great many curry restaurants in Britain used horse meat for their meat curries. My student days in Bradford back in the 1970s included many such meat madrasses and meat vendaloos. Never advertises anything other than meat, never as beef, still less as horse. So far as I'm aware, all that ended in 2013 with the so-called horse meat scandal. There's no practical reason why horse meat is not sold or eaten in Britain. Not eating horse meat is simply part of being British, in the same way Muslims and Jews avoid pork. My assumption is that in Anglo-Saxon times, horse meat was only eaten for very specific feasts, and all but taboo at other times. It's a bit like the way turkeys are mostly only eaten in December because of the close association with Christmas, which has developed in recent decades. Turkeys aren't taboo at other times, although a little tricky to obtain. It's just that we opt not to eat them except as part of Christmas rituals. And unless there had been a horse cult in Anglo-Saxon England which had a similar influence on eating horse meat, 
then British people would presumably consume horse meat as readily as on the continent. And, well, all of these speculations prompted by remarkable excavations in a field at the side of, well, what's now a very busy trunk road. <laughs> 